Is violence ever justified in the pursuit of political or social aims? And where it is justified, how can we actually argue for it? To uh, discuss and debate that particular issue, we have a stellar panel here. Uh, on my left-hand side is Professor Steven Pinker of Harvard University, one of the best-known public intellectuals in the world. Uh, on the right-hand side from where I'm uh, sitting, Tariq Ali, also one of the world's best-known public intellectuals. And to my immediate right here is uh, Elif Sarijan, who is an activist in the Kurdish women's movement and UK coordinator of the Kurdistan Students' Union. Would you please welcome our panel here today? I'm going to start by opening up the debate with three short statements from our key speakers in which they look at various aspects of the question of violence and its place in politics and society. And Tarek, could I start with you? I'm going to ask the straight question to which I think I know the simple answer, but I'd love to hear your take on it. Are there occasions when the use of violence can and should be justified in seeking political ends? I think so. And I think history teaches us that. I mean, there are, of course, different forms of violence. I'm not and never have been a supporter of terrorism, uh, defined as it should be defined, either individual or that used by states. But I am a strong supporter of, historically speaking, of all the revolutions that have taken place, the slave rebellions that have taken place in history, starting, if you like, with the American Revolution against British colonialism, carrying on to the French Revolution, the revolution of the Enlightenment, the link between the intellectuals prior to the revolution and the revolutionaries was very strong. The English Revolution, which laid the foundations of democracy, which is why Cromwell's statue is still outside the House of Commons. So far, no one has argued that it should be removed, though they don't allow stamps with Cromwell's head on it, because it requires the monarch's head on it, too. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, of course, in the 20th century, We've had a whole wave of uh, revolutions and revolutionary struggles which have deployed violence, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese, Vietnamese, Cuban, the huge anti-colonial struggles waged by the Vietnamese. So I'm afraid it's very difficult studying modern or medieval history uh, or uh, early modern history to get away from this uh, idea of violence. And I think we have to detach the violence used by masses in motion uh, from acts of individual terror carried out for whatever reason, or suicide terrorism, or, or whatever. I mean, the struggle of people for their freedom has always involved violence because the people they're trying to gain independence from deploy it as well. So the choice is either to sit down and do nothing or to hope that peaceful agitation wins the day, which it never has, with very few exceptions, and, and to throw the path open to those who occupy, oppress, and uh, kill people ad nauseam. I mean, this goes on today, even as we're sitting here. Six wars are being waged in the, United, uh, in the world by the United States, the most brutal of which, which is hardly mentioned, is the war in the Yemen being waged by Saudi Arabia and its allies, backed by the United States and Britain. So what are the poor Yemenis to do? Thanks very much indeed, uh, Tarek. We may well discuss exactly that point in just a few minutes. But let's turn first to uh, Stephen Pinker. Stephen, we've heard that case that peaceful engagement on its own simply hasn't been a useful way of changing society, with the exception of a very few cases. You have spoken out for better angels uh, very, uh, very publicly. Would you agree with the case that Tarek has made? Uh, no, I wouldn't agree. I guess I start from the premise that killing people is bad, and killing uh, more people is worse than killing fewer people. So even though I, I also don't support terrorism, uh, terrorists have killed a tiny number of people. The worst terrorist attack in history, 9-11, killed 3,000. Typical terrorist attack kills uh, a handful. 
Uh, whereas wars and revolutions kill people by the millions and tens of millions. And often uh, it is true, Tariq listed a number of violent events in human history. Uh, we do not make the argument that these are, uh, are good or justifiable. These were history's disasters. Now, I do believe that there are arguments that there can be occasions in which violence is justified if it is the only way to prevent greater violence. Again, I'm assuming that, that murdering people is bad. If you disagree with that, then you can disagree with the whole argument. And that murdering you know, 2 million people, 4 million people, 20 million people is really, really bad. Now, did the events that we just uh, heard result in uh, the reduction of uh, violence, prevention of killing of even greater numbers, which I suppose could be used as a utilitarian argument justifying violence. The answer is, in, in virtually all the cases, no. The uh, French Revolution was a disaster, killed two million people, led to the rise of Napoleon, perhaps the world's first totalitarian fascist dictator who began wars of conquest that killed another, an additional four million people, led to the restoration of slavery, to the restoration of the uh, monarchy and a delay of democracy in France by uh, perhaps a century. Russian Revolution killed uh, several million, led to the Russian Civil War, which killed another nine million, led to the rise of Stalin, who killed 20 million. There's an old cliche, you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. Well, it ignores the fact that people aren't eggs and that generally it does not result in an omelet. Again, the Chinese Revolution, perhaps the most disastrous event in, in history, led to the, the uh, Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, which killed perhaps uh, 30 to, to 40 million people uh, altogether. Time and again, a violent revolution, violent, violent war, in addition to the moral harm of mass murder, and again, I mean murder, we're talking about millions or tens of millions of people, does not result in a uh, stable, peaceful state that saves the lives of even more. Quite the contrary. You know, a recent study by um, Maria Stefan and Erica Chenoweth actually looked over the last century at violent and nonviolent resistant movement, resistance movements to put the Gandhian hypothesis to a test that, it, that there are ways of overcoming tyranny uh, using the, all of the tactics that, uh, that Gandhi worked out. Now, you could of course, be cynical about the Gandhian hypothesis by saying, well, he um, tugged at the heartstrings of, of the British at an opportune moment, and he just got lucky. So they decided to count. Uh, of the, all of the resistance movements of the 20th century, uh, they divided them into violent ones and nonviolent ones, putting aside the question of which was more moral, that is, which murdered fewer people, just ask the question of which is more effective. Now, it's not the case that violent resistance movements always succeed or the nonviolent ones fail or vice versa. But if you count them up, so they found that nonviolent resistance movements were three times as effective as uh, violent ones. It doesn't mean the violent ones are never effective, but even in terms of sheer efficacy, the nonviolent ones uh, tend to have a higher success. When you say three times as effective, Stephen, do you mean they killed one-third as few people? Or? No, they, uh, three times more often they resulted in uh, regime change. Okay, that's an interesting definition and one that I think we will have to come back and to a, in, the, in the discussion. A final observation is that in a, in a survey of what leads to stable democracies, uh, inspired in part by the uh, 2003 invasion of Iraq, which I think we all agree was not a successful uh, uh, measure to, to uh, install a, a peaceful liberal democracy. It, in, that actually fits into a pattern that uh, decapitations of a uh, existing tyrannical regime generally don't result in a uh, stable democracy. I'll add with one final observation. Uh, I'm Canadian. So uh, we actually did achieve independence from uh, Britain nonviolently, and uh, uh, we ha took a little bit longer than the United States. Uh, but the, the American Revolution was a pretty bloody uh, and, and brutal mess as well. And uh, Canada has result is today one of the uh, most stable, least violent, and most democratic societies on Earth. So much so that there are prominent politicians in this country who want Britain now to become Canada or something called Canada plus, 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 so I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Elif Sarajan, you know a great deal, both in theory and in practice, about the way in which coercion, violence and resistance have been used in certain very prominent recent conflicts. I wonder if you could give us your thoughts in the next couple of minutes. So I think when we talk about whether violence or conflict is necessary for some sort of lasting change, I think it's important 
when we discuss these, um, the framework in which we discuss them in terms of, you know, we don't have the time for that right now, but even to acknowledge, you know, the history and the roots of the ideas of war and um, essentially, you know, people um, mass murdering each other um, for, you know, whatever purpose or whatever means it may be. And I think from the historical references that we have access to, I think it's quite, uh, I think we can quite comfortably say that the history and the roots of war are also the history and roots of patriarchy. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.